Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Mitch Weisberg, and I realize that it's not quite 8 o'clock in, in New York yet, but it's close enough, uh, especially since we're coming up to Christmas time and, and New Year's. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight for our last EdChat Interactive of 2016 uh, with Tracy Weeks of CETA. Uh, we'll be talking about finding and evaluating great digital materials. And in our usual fashion, uh, I'm going to start off with a little bit of an explanation of the Shindig, pass, uh, Shindig platform because it's probably different from what a lot of you are used to if you've done webinars before. And first, a little bit about EdChat Interactive. Uh, our purpose here is to provide you with things that you can go back to your schools with and use right away. And we understand that the typical webinar format of just a talking head isn't going to do that. So we've tried to build a lot of interact into our sessions. And you'll find, uh, I'll go through the, the, some of the different ways, but our idea, our idea is that if you're interacting with each other, you're reflecting, you're participating, then you're learning much more effectively. And you all, you all know that with, with your students. So I'm going to ask you tonight, to not be back row people. You know, the back row people are the ones who sit in the back of the classroom and they kind of sit back and it's like, well, you know, I hope I learn something, but um, but I'll, I'll, I'll let the people up there do all the work. I'd like you to be front row learners tonight. The front row people are the ones who say, you know something, I'm going to learn something tonight that I'm going to take back and I'm going to participate, I'm going to talk to other people, and I'm going to interact with the presenters. So I'm going to ask you all to be front row learners tonight. As we first, though, go through the different features of the Shindig platform. So, how can you interact on Shindig? First of all, if you look under your avatars, there are two buttons. There's the raise hand button. There's going to be times where we say, "Will somebody like to come up on stage and talk to Tracy, uh, or give an example of how you do how you're applying this technique?" In which case, what you'll do is you'll click on the raise hand button. I'll see you. That way I know that, that, that you're volunteering, and I'll bring you up. The second button underneath your avatar is ask. That's, that's the way you'll ask a question. If you click on the ask button, you get a dialog box, and that, uh, that gives you the opportunity to type in your question. I'll see the question, and I'll pass it to Tracy. Uh, if it's a technical question, I'll, I'll answer it myself. So that's the ask button, that's the raise hand button. Uh, the third way of interacting is through interacting with your participants through IEMing. If you move your cursor over your avatar, there'll be a five icon menu that appears. You can see that on the screen right here. One of the items on the menu is IM. I'd like you to click on it right now. That's gonna open up a box on your screen that you can type in and you can message the other people here. Uh, what would be great is why don't you type in, uh, type in um, where you're from and maybe something that you'd like to get out of tonight's session. And if you see a comment that you can provide an answer to, uh, why don't you start interacting with each other? So click on that I am button, open up the dialog box, and that's the third way of interacting. Now, the fourth way of interacting is kind of like a hangout within this session. So you, you see that there's, if I, if I decrease the size of, of the screen, uh, you see that there's avatars of other people floating around the screen, and some of them have uh, video cameras. If you click on the avatar of another person, you can have a, um, a voice discussion or video discussion with that other person. So let, I'd like to encourage you to do that. Maybe um, we'll take two minutes and, and do that. If you have a webcam and you, you see somebody else who has a webcam, you could even click on Tracy if, if you wanted to. Uh, click on the avatar of another person. And why don't you talk about what's your favorite digital research and how you use it and listen to them. And maybe, maybe we can start sharing early this time. I'm going to bring myself down, and I'll come back in about a minute or two. Okay, I see a few of you were able to do that. That's great. And I hope a number of you are typing in the I am box. As it turns out, I'm the one person who can't see what you're typing in the box. So um, so I can't tell that, but uh, but Tracy can see that. And I see that we do have also have a person who 
is on a tablet. Now, if you're on a tablet, the only way that you can interact is to ask a question. So if you have a comment that you want to share with others and you're using a tablet, uh, click on that Ask button, type in the question, and I'll share it out to, to everybody. Uh, so let me, let me just go on. And this session is really brought to you through FETC, the FETC Future of Education Technology Conference, which will be January 24th to 27th in Orlando. Uh, Tracy's going to be speaking there. I'm going to be there, so I'd, I'd love to see you. And if you haven't registered yet, if you click on the link here or just go to FETC and you use the code EDCHAT8, you'll get a $30 reduction in whatever the current price is for FETC. So I'd like to encourage you to go. It, it happens to be one of the top, if not the top, uh, tech conference in the, in the winter. So, um, so, so come on down. It's also warm for those of you who are in the north. And then I mentioned that this is our last EdChat Interactive of 2016. We have a few scheduled in 2017 already. Uh, the first two in January, we have uh, Tom Murray from Future Ready Schools is going to be talking about how you can become a Future Ready School. Uh, a lot of you probably are familiar with Sylvia Martinez, who talks about the maker movement. Uh, she's going to be talking about girls and boys in STEM on January 12th. And then we have one the following week. And then the following week after that is going to be FETC. Hope to see you at one of the, one of the sessions in January. And now let me bring up uh, Tracy. And you can see Tracy's bona fides right here. Let me stop this. And Tracy. Well, Merry Hi. Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yes, I'm parked here in front of the tree instead of my uh, what has become my junkier little uh, office. So thanks for having me, Mitch. Well, thanks. Thanks for coming. And you know, before you were at CETA, what what, what did you do before CETA? So immediately before coming to CETA, I was with the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction as the Chief Academic and the Learning Officer. And it's one of the first states that we know of that had a senior leadership position that focused both on academics and digital learning. So that was quite an exciting opportunity. Um, and prior to that, I led the North Carolina Virtual Public School. But I've had a history. I've actually been a high school math teacher, I've been a, a building level tech facilitator and a district level um, instructional technology director. So I've had roles at I think just about all the different levels now. So how did you get your Boston accent? <laughs> yes, no, not so much Boston. No, I'm in North Carolina, as you might hear. <laughs> Proud of it. Okay, so I'll bring myself down. Let me bring your, let me bring your slides up. Great. And uh, let, let's, let's move on. Well, good evening, everyone. And uh, while Mitch is bringing up the slides, um, I'll go ahead and just kind of get you started with um, with telling you a little bit about CETA first, and then talking about the work that we're doing around finding and evaluating great digital materials, and having an opportunity for us all to engage. What some of those key kind of questions and thoughts and and um, issues around especially um, evaluating, but you know, it's interesting as, as Mitch was sharing with me what people hoped to get out of this session, it was pretty evenly split between folks who really wanted to know all the places to find them and all the ways to evaluate them. We'll talk a little bit about both, but we're really going to get even into some broader issues as well. So go ahead to the next slide, uh, Mitch, and I'll tell you a little bit about CETA. Um, so first of all, CETA stands for, it's the State Education Technology Directors Association. So as you know, every state in the U.S. has a Department of Public Instruction or a Department of Education, some kind of state education agency. We work with all of those state education agencies in every state, specifically with their education technology leadership. Um, and we're really here to make sure that we basically support those, the capacity of those state and national leaders to improve education through technology policy and practice. And as you can see, we do everything from advocacy to professional learning um, and really all of those things that would support our ed tech leaders. All right, let's go on. 
to give you an example of some of the work we have done in the area of advocacy, we really like to contribute back to the field. Uh, and this kind of does a backwards walk through some of our more recent publications. Um, in 2012, I'll actually start at the bottom of the list, we released the broadband imperative. And this really set targets for broadband goals in schools and districts. Uh, both looking all the way out to the 2016-17 the school year, which we are now in. So jump ahead to 2016, and we've just released a new paper outlining targets that we call bold and, and aggressive goals for where we would like to see all of our schools get to. And one of the reasons that we want to be great advocates of having high quality broadband at every school goes to the very topic that we're talking about tonight that if we want to be able to have great digital materials available to our teachers and our students, then we have to have reliable and high quality broadband access to make sure that we can get to all of those materials. Um, we don't want teachers and students to ever have to worry about whether or not they're going to be able to get to them, whether the internet's going to be down or whether it's going to be too slow that day because someone's taking an assessment down the hall. We want that to be you know, like the plumbing in, in your house that is just not something that you have to worry about. You can also see, uh, I want to point out our guide to implementing digital learning in 2014, as well as OER case studies. We've done a good bit of work uh, related to OER. Um, but we've also done a good bit of work. You'll see one of the papers over there on the right that's called Navigating the D Digital Shift. And that was really a paper that really talks about as states and districts are increasingly moving from print materials to digital materials. What are some of the challenges that come with that? And, and, and that we will talk about a good number of those things this evening as well. Um, but, you know, it turns out, and I know that this, this will be no surprise to you all, that uh, you can't use the same methods for evaluating materials for print as for digital. Um, it just requires, it, there's a different level of granularity. There's a different level of sort of refresh rate. Um, and comfort level that comes with it. So there are a lot of things that we have to consider with digital materials that weren't necessarily something that uh, had to be dealt with when it was print. So let's go on and um, kind of take you to where we are now. CETA is actually in the process of creating an online toolkit uh, that we believe should go live, I would say, this summer to this fall that really is going to be uh, providing a planning tool um, or really a, a whole toolkit in each of these areas, planning, selection, implementation, and effectiveness to look at all of these different areas when it comes to finding quality instructional materials. And we're going to spend a little bit time of time in each of these four areas tonight because um, we've really found that all four of them are critical if you're really going to do um, successful work with educators and with students around high quality digital materials. So let's go ahead and we're going to dive into the first area. And we're actually going to get into our first little discussion area. Um, and I know Mitch is going to help us break out into some sm smaller groups. But here are the questions that I would like for your, your group to focus on. Whether you're at the school or district or state level, it doesn't really matter. But how does your school or district state provide guidance on the selection of digital instructional materials? Um, and if they don't, then what do you do about it? What resources do you leverage uh, to actually make your selection? So let's take just a few minutes and let you split up into some groups um, and, uh, and go ahead and discuss that. And then we'll come back together and we'll provide an opportunity to share out. Well, this is the first discussion. Uh, if you have a webcam, click on the avatar of somebody else with a webcam and start and start discussing these questions. Uh, if you don't have a webcam, then in that IM window, I'd like to encourage you to type in some comments um, to, an to answer the questions and to respond to others. And if you're using a tablet, uh, click on the Ask button and I'll share out your comments with everybody else. Uh, I'll pull myself down and uh, give, you, give you three, four minutes in order to get these discussions going. Hey, Tracy, welcome hey, Tracy, back. Welcome back.
Thanks, Mitch. All we right, hoping everybody. I, I didn't get a chance to join into any of the groups. I was checking one other thing. Um, but I do see that there have been some group discussions going on. And I'm curious if there's anyone who has a story or anything that they learned that they'd like to share related to any guidance they're getting from state, school, or district level, or if they're not, how you have been super resourceful. So this is your time to click on the raise hand button. And by the way, ah, good. And, and if you're getting an echo, then separate yourself from the group because you're probably hearing our voice through somebody else's speakers. But I see um, Claudia uh, volunteered, so I'm going to pull myself down and pull Claudia up. Hi, I'm Claudia Dilgen. I am from uh, Broward County. I'm an online course designer. Excuse my look because it's late here and I've worked all day. Um, we just bought a learning management system, Canvas, and we are looking to um, bring in uh, OERs and create material and uh, have an object repository that teachers can get to, but we don't have a way of deciding if this content is good, if it's, you know, uh, develops higher uh, critical thinking skills. What we've been doing is there's a bunch of rubrics that we found on the internet kind of looking at stuff, but this process is just beginning for us, and I think we really need to come up with um, some standards and a solid way of looking at this stuff. That's yeah, good. fair enough. Yeah, and I, I would say that I, th I think you're definitely not alone, um, and especially as we increasingly go towards digital, I think there are a lot of people trying to figure out how do we go, because it's really a shift, right? When we did print materials, usually there was some committee somewhere that reviewed a whole bunch of publisher textbooks, picked out yeah. a, you know, a few of the best ones that were aligned to standards, and then you, you, your school or somebody just purchased one and said, here, use this, and then you went and found ancillary materials. Um, yeah. And now we're just in a different era. Yeah. 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 Thanks, Claudia. Anybody else want to share? All right, well then Mitch, if not, then we can go ahead and proceed on to the next uh, slide to, to share sort of these first thoughts surrounding planning and some of the things to look for when it comes to planning and why, why is this even such an important thing. Um, so, you know, I would say that one of the reasons that I really am, am drawn to this stage of planning is kind of looking at what's already out there that you have to support you. Increasingly, states and districts are starting to wrap their heads, and many of them even have some policies and practices um, in place that, um, that, they, that they have to help educators um, either locate or evaluate instructional materials, and others are, are frankly still in the development stage of this. But also determining who the stakeholders are when it comes to digital materials. Not only are we talking about teachers, we're talking about students, we're talking about parents. So who are all the people um, that really will be affected by this? But to me, the most important thing to look at are what are your goals and what are you trying to do and what's the outcome? And one of the reasons that I think that this is so particularly important and um, you know even when we do our work surrounding broadband for example I always take it back to this that we really need to have clear instructional outcomes in mind on what we want to do and and ask ourselves why is it that we're doing this digitally um, what is this gaining for us uh, in some places it may be it's a new school or a new building and you don't have print materials and so it doesn't really make sense to go out and fix them but if you do have print materials why would you shift to digital? What is it going to bring to the learning process that you don't already have? And there are a lot of fantastic and really great reasons. There are educators out there who want to really personalize learning. There are educators who want to be able to uh, perhaps utilize a universal uh, design for learning framework so that they can really provide students with multiple um, forms of acquiring content and assessing against the content. So there are a number of ways that it can be really, really purposeful and really change the game. 
But then also, and we'll get to this in the last circle when we get to effectiveness, but what are your success metrics? How will you know if what you used was worthy? How will you know if it was a good thing? You also need to look at your budget. And if you acquire these digital materials, where will they live? Does your school or district or state have a learning object repository where these things can be housed? Uh, as Claudia mentioned, they're using a learning management system. And Canvas is one that also has a learning object repository that can be utilized. Some do, some don't. So where will you house your content? Um, and then what technology do you have available to you, both in school and if your expectation is that your students will also use it outside of school, what technology do they need or do they have? So these are all questions that really kind of need to, you have to wrap your brain around during the planning phase. So let's go ahead and shift to selection. And we'll start this off with an opening question as well. And this one is really one that we're wrapping our heads around. Um, you know, is whether or not digital resources should be held to the same quality standards as print materials. Why or why not? And then I've got an, uh, another question down there. What about open educational resources? In other words, if you have high expectations for print or digital or free and digital, do you have the same level of expectation no matter which type of material you are accessing? So why or why not? And how will you determine kind of what your standards are? Um, do you hold them all to the same? So let's go ahead and give it uh, a few minutes for you to pair or triple or quadruple up again. Uh, and kind of kick this thought around, and then I'll give you an opportunity to share in just a couple of moments. Okay, you know the drill. Uh, click on an avatar if you have a webcam, and if you don't have a webcam, make sure that your IM window is open and type in some answers, uh, some of your thoughts about whether digital resources should be held to the same quality standards as print materials or different standards and about open education resources and we'll come up in a few minutes. Hey, 